Put your hands together if you please. <coughs> Welcome to our amazing Hollywood Badger interview uh, panel that we have tonight, uh, set up for you and your pleasure. We have two absolutely amazing guests. You are probably familiar with their work. Yes, you guys know movies such as Airplane, uh, the Naked Gun series, Top Secret. There are a lot of them out there. These guys have a certain style of humor that is bar none my personal favorite. Uh, comedy that's out there. Let's hear it right now. Put your hands together for Jim Abrams and Jerry Zucker. All right. There you go, guys. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming out, you guys. We're so glad. We know a lot of you guys had some difficulties with uh, traffic on your way up here. Um, and so we're glad that everybody was able to make it out. Um, right now we're actually also streaming live. We've got three cameras set up in this room and we're streaming live to audiences all over the country, but particularly to students at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Right now we are streaming to them. Let's hear it for our students right there. So all you guys out there, I don't know which camera is working on me right now, but I hope you guys are enjoying the show. It's a little late, but you know, it's a, you know, students will be able to hold up with that whole situation, you know how that works. Um, so um, we're really excited to have you guys here. And yeah, I think so. How's your sound doing up there with that? Good? You can hear them? We're check. we're doing a little, we had a little sound check, we're doing a little technical stuff. How about now? <laughs> All right, they're going to work on that in the meantime. I think while they're figuring out some of those issues that we're dealing with, I think that we should watch a video, a uh, compilation that I got from you guys. There's some really amazing stuff. We've got, it starts with uh, the original movie trailer for the movie Airplane. And then we go in, Airplane. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Which I think just had its 30th anniversary recently. Wasn't that just last year? It's hard to imagine. Hard to imagine, you guys. Um, it is still as good as it ever was. It's one of those movies that holds, holds up to, uh, to the test of time, and everybody, everybody that I know still loves it and adores it and quotes from it constantly. I think it's probably arguably the most quotable movie out there, if I, if I, if I dare say. Um, so after we watch that, we're also going to see a little bit of uh, the days back when you guys uh, started in Madison. We've got some really old clips from uh, theater, some, some com arts class and that sort of thing. Then we're going to follow to the point where these guys, yes, Madison the students, these guys are students from UW, that's why we got them here. Um, and then we're going to move on and see a little bit of uh, the very beginnings of Kentucky Fried theater, which is when they moved out to Los Angeles and started a, a live theater. And after that, uh, seeing some of, the, some of the Kentucky Fried Theater and how that worked out, we're going to see some of their concepts that they did in the theater or spoofs and how those ended up being taken seriously. Because basically, everything that you guys do, uh, the best stuff that you guys do, I feel, find, is like making fun of stuff that should be taken really seriously. And, and so we'll hear, see that as well. But in the meantime, while we're watching it, at any point in time, if you guys want to watch on the screen back here and give us any feedback or tell us any stories, uh, just go ahead and talk, talk over it, and we'll see what's going. And meanwhile, I, I can actually give you this microphone if you guys can. Let's put it right between you two. So if you have a... I think it's working somewhat, but let's do that one too. It'll be louder. It can feed and back. Let's see what movie we've got. So, ladies and gentlemen. The airplane! <laughs> Stand by for the most extraordinary chain of events ever swept up into high adventure. Hey, Larry, where's the forklift? Forklift! Take over there for the baggage water! Airplane! Leslie Nielsen. This woman has to be gone to hospital. A hospital? What is it? It's a big building with patients. That's not important right now. Lloyd Bridges. Johnny, what do you make out of this? This? Why can't they clap? For a brooch? For pterodactyl? Please keep your hands. Robert Stack. All right, Steve, let's face a few facts. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your flight. Julie Haggerty. By the way, is there anyone on board who knows how to fly a plane? Yes! Can you fly this plane and land it? Robert Hayes. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. I've got to get out of here. I've got to get out of here. Come down. Get a hold of yourself. 
Incredible adventure the screen has ever created. He's coming right at us! The big news is Airplane. Oh, poor Ralph. Do you know what it's like to be married to a wonderful man for 14 years? No, I can't say that I do. I did uh, live with a guy once, though, but that was just for a couple of years. Oh. Usual slurs, rumors, innuendos people didn't understand. Oh. Ran him out of town like a common pygmy. Did he have any enemies? Well, the Democrats didn't like him. Sure, he was a physical education major, but he had a mind. He could think. It wasn't all muscle, all body, all sinewy limbs. He got married, you know, later, had three kids. Never cared for her. Sent a nice gift, never got a note. Now, I know this is a long shot, but did he ever eat chop suey? I told him she was wrong. And that youngest boy, just like his father, football hero. Lived with him for a year. Wasn't the same. Can't go back. It's been said that the test of a man's courage is how he performs in the face of danger. Well, in the next half hour, you're going to meet a very unique breed of cat. The kind of man who doesn't know the meaning of the word fear. Rex Kramer, part-time airline mechanic, full-time daredevil. A man willing to risk his life for the sake of adventure. He has to chase it, confront it, and whip it. Rex Kramer, danger seeker. Something happening here But what it is ain't exactly clear Now if you're tired or if it's run down Can't seem to catch a feet off the ground Maybe you ought to try a little bit of LSD Only if you want to shake your head and smell your brain Make you act just a bit insane Give you all the slack and energy you need to see Last, a scientific breakthrough of the century, available in 8th Decorator Colors' new Miracle Cup. Unique circular top construction with gently tapered walls and patented dural flat bottom make Miracle Cup the perfect solution to all those testy household receptacle questions. Looking for the answer to the thirst problem? No problem for Miracle Cup. Just pour in the desired beverage, raise to lips, tip, and swallow. Miracle Cup takes care of the rest. 
At low popular prices, it's Packer & Gimbel's new Veggio Slice-O. Constructed from durable polyethylene, the Veggio Slice-O is a perfect addition to every kitchen. No longer does the lady of the house have to toil over salad vegetables and luscious hors d'oeuvres to garnish her table. Just insert the fruit or vegetable in the conveniently located orifice and set the handy Mosier dial to the desired consistency and chop. The result is the same uniform slicing that hallmarks fine restaurants the world over. The Veggio Slice-O is perfect for apples, onions, pears, avocados, and lasagna. Three, five. <laughs> Police tickets! We need you to stay here! Uh, this is Charles Corrault on the road. We're here outside of the stadium where the throng is beginning to crowd in for the opening kickoff. We have with us Mr. Maurice Stern, who is a ticket scalper. Mr. Stern, have you been, have you been uh, scalping tickets for a number of years? Not scalping, buying and selling. Who needs tickets? Very good, very good. Here we're ready for a kick. They're waiting in the end zone. It's over. It's over. And it goes into the crowd. That looks like Ferguson and Smith getting it. And they pass it to it looks like it looks like it's in the first row. And we should see a pass pretty soon. They're scrambling for it now. They're scrambling. Jim, there, there it goes. That was a long pass. That looks what row does that look like, Jim? I think we're about, I think we're about halfway up now, Dave, and I'm there it is, another phenomenal thing. projects. Phenomenal projects are working well up into the top runs yeah, of the and this is fine. Going very well, beautiful. extremely well, and it's over. That was beautiful. Do you, have, do you have any kind of strategy to, in order to, to keep people from taking the football? I have no idea at all. Have you ever worked in the suicide squad over there? I'm trying not to be into it. <laughs> Los Angeles, California, a drama unfolding before your very eyes. Citizens living in the vicinity of this vacant lot want to save this sign. It seems a large corporation wants to... Hello. Hi. This is Captain Wilson and our first officer, Mr. Stewart, and this is Mr. Stryker and his son, Joey. We don't want to be in the way up here, but I just thought the boy might have a quick look. Come on, move up here. You can see better. Joey, here's something we give our special visitors. Would you like to have it? Thank you. Thanks a lot. You ever been in the cockpit before? No, sir. I've never been up in a plane before. You want me to check the weather, Bill? No, I'll get it. Excuse me. We better get back now. Uh, Joey can stay up here for a while if you'd like to. Could I get? Okay. If you don't get in the way. Thanks very much. Flight 714 to Winnipeg Radio. Climbing, climbing to cruise 8,000. What's the latest on the weather, please? Niner, this is Denver Flight Control. You're approaching some rough weather. Please climb to 42,000 feet. Roger, Denver. We have a visitor. Oh, hello. Hi. This is Captain Over, Mr. Murdoch, and Mr. Foster. This is Joey Hammond. Oh, hi, Joey. Come on up here. You can see better. Joey, we have something here for our special visitors. Would you like to have it? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Sure. You ever been in a cockpit before? No, sir. I've never been up in a plane before. You ever seen a grown man naked? Do you want me to check the weather, Clarence? No, why don't you take care of it? Joey, do you ever hang around the gymnasium? We'd better get back now, Joey. No, Joey can stay here for a while if you'd like. Could I? Okay, if you don't get in the way. Wait. What? what is it, Wayne? We're at war! Those dirty crouts. <laughs> Lousy jacks. Well, there's a sale at the Broadway. <laughs> Look at this. Passengers certain to die. Airline negligent. There's a sale at Penny's. Tell me, Johnny, what do you know about a girl named Rosie who used to live in Cahunda? I don't know, Cap. All of a sudden, my memory ain't so good. Maybe this will 
refresh your memory, Johnny. That's a pretty bad memory, Kappa. How about this? Oh, it's kind of hazy. This should do it. No, I don't think so. Borrow a dollar, Johnny. How about this? I want to ask you some questions. You're familiar with that face? I don't know. My memory ain't so great. Oh, yeah? Maybe this will refresh your memory. I don't know. It's still kind of hazy. How about this? Yeah, I remember him. I used to see him around. Why do you want to know? I can't tell you that. Well, maybe this will help. I really don't think I should. Yeah, you still don't think so? All right, his name is Nordberg. He's a cop. He was no cop. He was dealing H. What? I'm telling you, he was dirty. Oh, you sniveling scum. I ought to run you in right now. All right, all right. He worked at Ludwig's shipping. He tried to push something on one of my boys, I swear it. So what are you going to do about it, copper? Well, why should I tell you? Maybe this will help. I still don't think I should tell you. Can you spot me a 20? How about now? All right, I'm going down the... Let's hear it for uh, Jim Abrams and Jerry Zucker. <laughs> All right. You guys, it was so exciting to see um, some of your past and your history, having come all the way from, uh, you're, you guys are from Milwaukee, right? In Milwaukee. Milwaukee area, right? Um, so was it, how did you guys get to know each other originally? I don't remember. No, we uh, um, are actually... Our fathers were business partners at one time, and uh, our sisters were roommates in, in college, and uh, our mothers used to dance at the Boom Boom Room in Milwaukee. <laughs> and uh, no, the families actually were close friends, so we, we uh, it is true that our, our, our uh, uh, Jim's dad and my dad were, uh, were business partners. It was real estate, though. Mm -hmm. David still has some uh, uh, stationery that says E to Z Realty on it. Uh -huh. yeah. oh, wow. so, did, so did you guys live in the same neighborhood, too, when you were, when you were growing uh, up? Well, we, uh, we lived in a suburb in Milwaukee called mm -hmm. Shorewood. Okay. And we, we both lived in that suburb. So not, did, not like New Store. Or anything. So to, even to this day, does, it, does any of those experiences from, from your childhood or references to Shorewood or things that you guys, like your very first comedy inklings, has that work it, worked its way into some of these films that we, we love so much today? Oh, I absolutely. <laughs> is, is there a lot of feedback here? Is it just... Uh, it might be a little boomy. We, we okay? Yeah. yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I don't think there's any question, but the, growing up in Milwaukee in the 50s uh, and 60s had a huge influence on who we became. You know, it was a, literally a different era, you know, everything was black and white, not just, not just uh, uh, TV, but, you know, social stuff. Um, you know, the parents were always right, there was a leave it to beaver, cops were always good, there was the FBI, and I think we always had, as you said a while ago, this instinct that none of that really, yeah, a lot of it really didn't have to be taken seriously, mm -hmm. and I think that was sort of the instinct we had as we were growing up in the Midwest back then. Yeah, and um, as you see, you guys uh, then, you all, all, all th uh, there's the other Zucker brother who isn't available, uh, wasn't available for us today, David Zucker, but all three of you guys ended up uh, going to the university, um, and then were you working on each other's movies and comedies and that sort of thing at, at the university level as well? We, we got together, um, actually, uh, it was 1970, Some of the black and white, horrible, grainy stuff that you, you saw there was um, was recorded with that, and it was it was like this big, reel to reel with a thick cord and a big camera. It's it, you know it, it's not nearly as good as, as my cell phone mm -hmm. now. <laughs> right? No, really, it's amazing to think how how uh, uh, how far we've gone to, uh, technologically. But but uh, we, we he just lent us this. He happened to have it, lent it to us, and we sort of all found ourselves in the basement of our house in uh, in Milwaukee, 
uh, and playing with this stuff, and we, we loved it because uh, unlike uh, uh, you know film, which we played around with a little bit, but it was still film was you know it was it's, it's sort of expensive, and you you know three minutes kind of roll, and you had to get it developed, and editing it was was a little more cumbersome, and and, and this was uh, so easy, and the best part about it is we could shoot something and then play it back right away and, and look at it and then say, either we'd laugh or we'd say, oh, well, let's try it this way, let's do this uh, differently. And we were playing around a lot with the frame, you know, because you could, you, you could see it as you were shooting it. So, which is, you know, unlike like uh, uh, film exactly, I mean, you could see it on the monitor and look at it back. And like, so that was really our beginning. I mean, it's just doing that. And then at some point we just said, hey, we, we had 20 minutes of, of material that we had, had uh, uh, compiled, and you know we started showing it to people, and they would laugh, and, and then we said, hey, you know, we should do something with this. We should, and we started this theater with uh, that had a lot of it was the videotape, but that a lot of it were live sketches, and we weren't really, we never really. Was was this at, in Wisconsin, Wisconsin, or is this okay? This is in Wisconsin, right? And we never really thought of ourselves as as uh, actors, but you know, we just we just did it because you know what that's you know that was it was fun and and it's where, really where we learned. I mean, we all obviously had some instinct for it, uh, but it's kind of where we learned what 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 makes people laugh by mm -hmm. the, doing it over and over in front of a live audience. And and I would actually advise you know anybody who <laughs> any of you were or fooling with comedy and uh, the best thing you could do is get it in front of an audience. You know, get a bunch of people in, give them something right. to drink, maybe, or whatever. <laughs> yeah. See what works. And, and, and see, what, see what works. Mm -hmm. And not just an audience of friends and relatives, but uh, an audience of people who really don't care and will be ruthless. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, so the, the first time you should start it out with friends. <laughs> or, or <drunk>. Good. <laughs> And then the next time you, you, you slowly add yeah. people, but Jim's right, you, you want, um, you don't want one of these audiences just laughing because they want to have a good time and they're your friend. You want uh, um, an audience more like what you want to entertain, you know, people who don't know you and are just walking in and, you know, sh okay, you say you're funny, let's see. Oh, okay, so I'm gonna pass the microphone over to you because apparently the other we're having trouble with technical difficulties, so we might pass it around. Um, in in any event, so yeah, it was working okay. I'm gonna move this microphone cable around the front so that we don't trip over it or anything. But um, continuing on, <laughs> one of the one of the things that I wanted that I noticed, which. I think it's so cool about you guys is the fact that you were able to, you were, you were some of the very first people, I, I think, who really brought multimedia to comedy. And I think that it's very commonplace now, and you see it in a lot of different ways, the, w the way that you can work between these different media in order to make funny stuff happen. Did you guys have, I think I heard someplace that you had something that was like a videotape that was actually streaming on State Street that was just people would walk by or something, that television that you would play. Was, it, was Did you guys do something like that at one point? I don't think so. No. no. Was, okay. <laughs> I was lied to. I was lied to. It's part of the legend. Uh-huh. Actually, I think what happened here, do you mind? <laughs> I'm just kind of <laughs> All right. When, yeah. This, is this better? <laughs> yeah. I, what, I but, the microphone worked. Oh. Is, oh let me see. I think Jerry. Give me that shot. Wait a minute. <laughs> let me see. All right. Now, just talk. <laughs> Hello? Yeah? yeah. Right. Technical break. Technical break. <laughs> if you two switch seats, then Jerry and John can share the mic. Or him is working. Uh, but theoretically, perfect. I now could also sit here. over here. <laughs> if, I sat, if I sat over here, or if we really wanted to do it properly, no, no, no. then I'd probably want to sit on his lap right about here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll work on a camera shot. Okay, Are we good? How does that work? Oh. Is this all right? How's all this right. feeling for you? I feel I, like I, you would, for me. You know, I could just pin this to my <laughs> Okay, so where were we? So yeah, so you guys, tell me about tell me about when you guys came to uh, to Los Angeles. Okay, um, 
we uh, so so we packed up everything into the U-Haul truck. I think you saw that picture of the three of us standing outside that U-Haul truck. That's uh, that was in Milwaukee, and and we we packed everything up, uh, you know, from Madison. I think we just stopped in in uh, in Milwaukee. Or was that before we went to Madison? No, it must have been. It was before, okay. Anyway, so then we, the truck was empty in the picture you saw. Um, <laughs> you know, full disclosure. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, and we went to, uh, you know, Madison, we packed up, you know, everything, floorboards. I mean, even the, you know, not only the lights and the costumes, but even the, the plywood, that's, that was expensive. It was like eight bucks a sheet or something. I don't know, whatever, 12. So we, we put it all in the truck. And and kind of caravan out to Los Angeles. And the chairs. And the chairs, right? The chairs, yeah. Um, and and. Uh, and that was all so that you guys could build a theater once you got to LA. Correct. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Okay, so we saw the Kentucky Fried Theater, and where was that? Where is that located? Does that still exist? Is it another building now? It. Um, it the Kentucky Fried Theater in Madison or in... Uh, the one in, in Los Angeles. That's the one that we saw on the video, right? Where you well, actually right. you saw some of the interior from Madison. There was one shot that was uh, where we were like throwing donuts oh, right. out into the... And that was... Uh, the story of that was it was our, our last show. And the back wall of the theater where we would perform, on the, uh, on just on the other side of the back wall, where we would perform, there was a donut factory. And, and so, and they would make fresh donuts every night while we were performing, as a matter of fact. While we were performing, you could hear the pop, pop, pop as they were squirting the dough into the boiling oil. And they would make fresh donuts and kids would get high and go back there and buy donuts in the middle of the night and it was great. So on, our, on the last night that we did Kentucky Fried Theater in Madison, we went and we got a big tray of donuts, and there's a shot in that clutch. And we were just kind of lobbing donuts out into the audience. And they liked it, and then they sort of threw the donuts back at us. <laughs> and then we threw them back at the kid. There was a big donut fight on our last night. It was great. Oh. So anyway, you guys, you guys were having some really great times, and you had those had those shots where I believe that was you, Jim, that was doing the interviews on the street with the guy who was scalping the tickets. Was that you? Yeah, yeah. Um, and and so at uh, at one point in time, they started. Was that a thing that they used to do in Madison, where they would throw the ball and just keep on throwing it after it? Yeah. So in, in, essentially, the nets that you see now behind uh, the the goalposts at NFL games was created by the University of Wisconsin Madison. I think we can we can assess clearly. Um, so anyway, you guys moved out to um, Los Angeles. How, what prompted you to want to make that and, move? And, and the team sucked back yeah. then. <laughs> and so and so kids would go to the game not so much to see the football game, but to see whether the balls would get stolen. <laughs> And then I'd eventually get chucked over the top of Camp Randall, yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, so anyway, you guys ma man managed to make it all the way out to Los Angeles. What prompted you to want to come out here, specifically? Uh, I, I, I think, <coughs> uh, you know, as the year went on that we did the show in Madison, uh, whereas at first it was just kind of a lark, as, as time went by we started to get more, like, into it and we, we're having more, <laughs> instead of just having fun, which we really always did, but we started to talk about, no, this, this works or this won't work and, and this is our style of humor and this isn't. And we, we you know, we, we were really into it and, and nobody wanted to stop doing it and we weren't really making money. We couldn't support ourselves on it. So we said, hey, you know, we got to, Let's try show business, you know, and and I think we thought it was maybe be you know more pleasant to starve in L.A. than New York, and and uh, uh, and also you know kind of movies and TV were more were more here even then, and and uh, uh, so we 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 picked L.A. Yeah. So what what was your first big break? What, where was the first thing that you felt like, oh yeah, we're really making it happen here? That was different than other other experiences you had. When airplane was successful, yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's not true. Our first big break—I don't know. You know, I don't know. 
Uh, maybe the big, you know, the only, I mean, there were a lot of things that went well along the line. The theater did well. Um, <clears throat> it was, you know, <clears throat> took a bit to get it, get word of mouth going, but the, but after a while we were filling the, the, the theater and all, and uh, then I think we, we decided to, you know, we were trying to figure out what, what we wanted to do, really. I, I don't think any of us wanted to be a, a uh, um, you know, up on stage uh, every night. And, and so we, you know, we had had some experiences on television. We actually were on The Tonight Show, but I, don't, I wouldn't view that as a big break. That was a big deal and something we had always fantasized about. But it, it, what, did, what did you guys do on The Tonight Show? We did just some skits and they were kind of like, they were actually, a bunch of them were, were a more pantomime kind of stuff as it worked out, but they were funny. The audience laughed, but I don't think they translated well on film because um, I, I, we kept running into people, um, you know, later who would say, "Hey, I saw you guys on the Tonight Show, huh?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and so okay, so so uh, we um, and I so I think, thought I think we thought you know t TV eats up material too fast and, and we want to be in show, we don't want to have someone else direct, you know, uh, uh, by the seat of their pants or whatever, and we just want to, you know, uh, take more time. So we wrote, um, uh, uh, actually, the first thing we did was write the first draft of, of Airplane, but we, it really was a, uh, a crude version of, of, of what it what it is now, but then we 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 thought, hey, let's do a bit movie, you know. So we started. We wrote Kentucky Fried Movie and met John Landis, and you know, took it around to all the studios, turned it down, and so we decided to put our <coughs> own money. The three of us uh, put our own money up and and made ten minutes of it, mm -hmm. uh, and and then took that around and showed uh, people and. The, the studio still <coughs> turned it down, but United Artists Theater Circuit, which is not the U.S. you know uh, studios, but the ones that own the the theaters, uh, they played it in one of their theaters, and people laughed, and so they decided to make it. And, and for me, I think that was the biggest like break. We were actually <coughs> making a, a movie, a feature, you know, and and. It, 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 and I remember after making those, the 10 minutes, you know, one of the most exciting times for all of us was the first time we played the 10 minutes in front of an audience at the New Art Theater. Um, we knew the guy who owned it at the, at the time and he let us... Okay, I thought they were playing exit music. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, and we, we uh, and he said, sure, I'll play this. And, and uh, the audience laughed, you know, and... Uh, it was, it was four bits from the film, and, and uh, that was kind of thrilling. And then the same guy actually said, I, I can get this finance. I'll get this finance. And he was the one, Kim Jorgensen, who took it to uh, United Artists Theater Circuit. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, maybe it's different. For, you have a different thought. For me, that was like a norm, an enormous uh, you know, moment. Yeah, I th there were a lot. Yeah. In, in all of them. I think a, a couple things <clears throat> that actually preceded that. One was when we were doing, when we had our theater in Madison, and it was kind of a lark, and we didn't really know what we were doing, and we'd kind of do it on the weekend, and then it was, in, as I said, in the back, you know, in, this, in a room sort of like this, actually. And every Saturday night when we were done, we'd lock the room and go away for a week and come back the next week. Well, one week, when we got back, the lock had been jimmied, and it hadn't, and it looked like it could have been, you know, somebody could have broken in. That's what happened. Somebody wanted to break in and steal our videotape equipment and our videotapes and all that, and the lock had been jimmied, and it was real fragile, and we just sort of touched it, and, the, and, the, and it opened. If the guy, whoever it was, who was going to steal our stuff, had jimmied it a little bit longer, he would have broken in, he would have stolen our stuff, and we would have gone on with life. I don't think we would have continued with, with theater or anything, you know, it was, a, it was so inevitable. Yeah, yeah, so that lock held. So I, I, I think of that as a huge break. And, 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 and the other... I, I, I never told you that was me. <laughs> and, 
and the other thing is, is that when we, in, in order to get new material for Kentucky Fried Theater, for the theater, what we would do is we'd leave the big old tape deck on that Jerry was talking about, and we'd record stuff in the middle of the night because we would, in the theater we do spoofs of TV shows or late night stuff because that's always the cheesiest stuff like Miracle Cup. And so we would leave this tape recorder on all night long and just record stuff. To, and then we'd come to work the next day and look at what we recorded to see if there's any grist for jokes. Uh -huh. And one day we got back to work after we leaving the tape recorder on all night. And we came in the morning and there was zero hour. We had taped zero hour. Mm. And, we t and it was perfect for us because it was a straight 1957 melodrama with Linda Darnell and Dana Andrews and Sterling Hayden. And it was zero hour. You saw a scene from it uh, just now. And we didn't, you know, it, it took years. That was probably like 73 or 74. Yeah. And the airplane got made in 80. So that was, there was a long period of time between when we came across zero hour and when the movie got made, but, or 79, I guess we made it. But, but that was a huge break. We found zero hour. That's amazing. So, so you guys, you, you, what, how, what was your process exactly when you were working on, on Zero Hour? Um, you know, coming up with the concepts for Airplane and how, you know, were you guys just watching it and get, kind of goofing around? Because I've noticed your style is very analytical. You guys really have rules for your humor. You have rules for what works and why it works and why it doesn't work, which is why it is a, a feeling all itself. So how did that play into actually creating Airplane? Well, I think, you know, for all the movies that we wrote, I think the first thing we always did was, uh, you know, look at serious stuff. And even in the show, you know, we're looking at serious commercials or something like that to try to see what, what uh, um, you know, find stuff to spoof. And so, all right, we decided to do a spoof on airline disasters and disaster movies. We saw every, not just Zero Hour, but every uh, flying film. And that's, that's really fun for us because we just, we play something and then someone says, no, 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 wait, stop it. How about, and then you, you say the line. I, I, there's a line in, I don't think it was Zero Hour, but one of those movies where a guy says, um, uh, surely you can't be serious, you know? <laughs> and then I, I don't, Maybe the guy probably said, "Unfortunately, I am," or whatever. I don't know, but 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 you know. So that's what you know. The the a lot of the setup lines other people have written for us, you know, and and or or situations like the, you know, the woman being slapped who's panicking. There was another. There was a movie where a woman was panicking, and and they were trying to get her to calm down. And so we just you know. Uh, now obviously that's you know. Um, I don't know what percentage of, of gags that, that it comes from. But then as we go along, I think it was just, you know, natural for us. I think at some point we, uh, David started writing the, down the rules just for fun because he was, David was always the archivist of the, of the group, you know. And, and uh, so he would, he, and I think he, he, he wrote an article, I think, for the New York Times or something, which listed the 12 rules or something like that. But, but I think for us, we had, you know, we didn't need to have a, pa you know, we just, they were, um, we had internalized them. And, and so we, we just sort of all uh, knew when, you know, uh, what we had to avoid and what we, uh, uh, what sort of we felt was our style or not our style. And, and we were, we were very much purists, particularly in airplane and, you know, getting that style of humor that really, um, you know, everyone to play it super seriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you guys, uh, one of the, th the aspects of it that I thought was so great, in the original, uh, in the Airplane, um, Leslie Nielsen is stone cold. He never cracks, he never does a joke, he never does it. By the way, let's hear it for the late, great Leslie Nielsen. Um, <laughs> And, and it, you know, every time watching him and the way that he's able to do it so stone cold and do these characters that are just so hilarious, but how he can pull off those jokes is just amazing. Um, what was it like working with him? Did you, um, and how did, how did he come to sort of, uh, later on in the Naked Gun movies, let's hear it for the Naked Gun uh, series, by the way. Um, 
how, how did that's, it, oh. that's, that's the last time we hear it for anything, okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> enough hearing it for it, all right. Um, so, other than us. Uh, yeah. Other than us. Yeah. We'll get you guys at the end again. Um, so, but in any event, they had, he, he ended up doing right, it. Let's hear it for clapping. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Leslie Nielsen. Uh, you know, when we first cast Leslie, the casting director said, Leslie Nielsen, he's the guy you go to the night before. You know, and, and uh, we had actually, I think we had offered it to someone else before that, but um, we loved, you know, we watched the Poseidon Adventure, and, and he had done so much episodic television, and we just, we loved his, his you know, that, that style, and we had no idea that he was really a closet comedian. And, in fact, people ask us, all the time, uh, you know, is, uh, how, you know, did you know Leslie, were you surprised that Leslie Nielsen could be that funny? And, and our response generally is, you know, after working with him uh, now for, uh, you know, and knowing him, we're surprised that he could do all that serious drama because he really is a nutty guy. I mean, he really is of, uh, and he's kind of a, you know what, what, one reason we all really got along, he's kind of an anarchist, you know, he, he loves doing things that's, against the authority figure and mocking authority figures and and he you know he he you know whatever happened in his childhood i don't know but he you know he he really um he 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 loved that um although you know for me you made you make an interesting uh comment about how you know pure and stone cold he was in and in an airplane we really talked to all these guys beforehand and we didn't we said we don't want you to play it straight we want you to act as though you don't know you're in a comedy. And that, that was really key because, you know, playing it straight, you know, people think they're playing it straight, but, but they're not really. And we really wanted all these guys, you know, we, we just, we wanted Robert Stack to be just the way he was in The Untouchables or any other, you know, uh, drama he's, he's been in this, and the same with all these guys. And, and um, uh, you know, and I, I think as the Naked Guns, you know, went on, you could see Leslie, having more fun with it, which I think is okay because, you know, he's now carrying the movie and, and uh, it's, uh, um, you know, I think for what it was, it was appropriate, but my favorite, you know, version of Leslie is, is the, yeah. you know, that, that airplane really straight version. Yeah. I, I, back then, I don't think that we, that David and Jerry and I really, differentiated. It was just this whole concept of casting straight actors in a comedy that was w really what we caught into. And it was really the biggest hurdle in getting Airplane made because the script was funny and people, different people were willing to, you know, finance it. But um, this whole, and even when we got to Paramount, there was still this leap of how can you put straight actors, and we didn't, I think we thought Graves and Stack and Bridges were all, uh, uh, and, and Leslie, were all of the same, and they were all of that same kind of rock solid dramatic actor. And that was the biggest leap in getting Airplane made, and it was only after Airplane that, that Leslie, you know, because the rest of those guys didn't wind up going into comedy. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, well, but, Bridges, you, you... Oh, yeah, yeah Lloyd yeah. did. Yeah, yeah, we worked with Lloyd yeah. some. Yeah, that's true. And, um, yeah, and, and, Ro and Robert Stack, I think, never... No, never no, another... No. I, mean, yeah. Yeah, I think we cast uh, right. Leslie in The Naked Guns because we felt so badly that we had ruined his career <laughs> right? <laughs> as a dramatic actor. And he it, it was, could no longer find work, so we uh, had to... It was interesting, too, and eventually Paramount took a flyer, uh, went along with us on an airplane, but it wasn't until the first day's dailies came through, and by sheer coincidence, the first, the first day we shot Leslie saying, I am sh serious and don't call me Shirley. And, that, and we got that night when the, when the Paramount executives saw those dailies, Jeffrey Katzenberg called and said, okay, now we get it. So when Airplane first came out, and I think that was a you know, much, much bigger, much, much broader release than Kentucky Fried Movie was, of course. Um, 
What sort of, I, I assume there must have been like negative reactions to it. Were there a lot of people who, who didn't understand it, they didn't get where it was coming from and they had a problem with it? No, everyone loved it. <laughs> that, they told me. Kind of everyone, again. yeah. Um, I probably should have read some of the reviews, but uh, no, it, we found it was, you know, there were, you're right, there were people that didn't get it. Pauline Kael, you know, panned it and said, you know, and there's not a comedian in the bunch. You know, she just didn't, she didn't get it. So it, it is a, um, you know, it's a sensibility that some people really get in love and other people, I mean, I remember we, we uh, took the movie to, uh, to Deauville, to the film festival in Deauville, France. It was, you know, for publicity, foreign publicity. And, and uh, they had a big, you know, screening, and and uh, and uh, Danny Kay was there. Yeah. It was in the audience. Remember that? Yeah. And I just remember looking at him. And he looked sick, you know. <laughs> and and I actually felt sorry for him in a way because, you know, when you think about Danny Kay's kind of humor, the chalice and the palace and the peasant with the well, you know, and all this stuff, you know, it's he's he's and he was brilliant. No, I mean Danny Kay was was a brilliant comedian, you know, but. It's such a different style, and and for I could see him looking at this and saying, "This is what everybody's making a fuss about. This is what you know. It's just like to see Robert Stack getting laughs. You know, it, it's it's uh, so I, I I think you know not everyone embraced it Im Im immediately Im immediately. But it was interesting too that when you know movies were marketed completely differently then, and and there were very few venues where you could advertise, you know, there was the newspaper and there were trailers in the theatrical trailers like the one they showed. And there were t towns where they would show that trailer that, that you showed earlier, although I can't believe shit hitting the fan was in the trailer. <laughs> uh, but they would, in the movie theaters where they played that trailer, the airplane opened well. And in the movie theaters where they hadn't shown the trailer, it didn't open as well. So the, the trailer was a, was a very good marketing tool. Because it, it was basically setting up people for what their for expectations that style, would be. For both yeah. those jokes and, and that whole approach mm -hmm. to comedy. Yeah. So you guys essentially created a, an entirely new brand of comedy that everybody associates with you now. And, and really, you know, it hits on all these levels that everybody associates with your names and, wh and what you've done in the past. Um, what do you think in terms of where comedy is going now, uh, do you like where it's going? Do you think there's a lot of good new stuff, or do you, do you think that it has never surpassed where you guys have had brought it to? <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't set the bar too high for these young people, no. I, uh, I, I, I do, well, I'm not sure where comedy is going. I like a lot of comedy that I, uh, that I see, you know. I, I, uh, um, uh, and I think there's a lot of funny stuff on the internet. It, it's just hard to, you know, sort out and to 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 find. You know, you you sort of need to hire someone with your taste to go and sort through all the videos and bring you the ones that are funny. But it it, it you know. But I think there's a lot of look. At, I think there's a lot of stuff I don't like too. I think one um, not so great thing is it's it's gotten very heavily reliant on um, swearing and sex jokes and, and, and we certainly have done our share of scatological humor but we always try to you know have a, a purpose for it and it wasn't you know laden with it and and uh, uh, and also I think we always felt that big budgets never helped comedies really I mean you know and so you know adding huge special effects and big whatever it, 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 you know it's all available now but it doesn't it 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 doesn't necessarily help but but uh you know i i laughed hard at the first hangover and i like um um you know uh i can't remember what uh, right. bridesmaids i loved you know and so i think that's i think that's great comedy uh, you know but but once again that you know, you look at bridesmaids. That's pretty scatological, but it all, you know, uh, it, to some extent, 
whether something is tasteful or tasteless, it, it depends to some degree on, on how f big a laugh it gets, you know? No, no, I mean, but that's, that's, that's true. All, you know, um, uh, 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 you know, laughter settles all arguments <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a certain way. Uh, but, but, and we always had a rule that if something was uh, it, 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 a, a sex joke or, or a, uh, you know, a swearing or something just got a titter, we'd cut it out. And even if it got a little bit of a laugh, it, it had to get a pretty decent laugh to, to, justify, it, to justify itself. And, and uh, um, you know, and I, I, don't, I don't know this day and age that people are as, as um, um, you know, concerned about, about no. that or that studios care at all. Um, the, other, yeah. the other thing is that we, as we talked, airplane was based on zero hour. And along with zero hour, which we didn't understand at all at the time, was a wonderful three act story. There's a first act, the second act, you know, boy, me, it, 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 at the beginning of Zero Hour, there's an actual line where Julie, the, the girl says to Robert Hayes, I can't live with a man I don't respect. And we left that in, I'm not sure why, but, but we did, and it was good we did. And at the end, she actually says, I want you to know now I'm so proud. And those are straight lines, and we put little gags at, at least at the end of the first one. But what that was about was there was a story in Zero Hour. And actually, it took us, the next movie we made was Top Secret, and you were very complimentary, and there were nice jokes in it. But we didn't really understand exactly all of why Airplane worked so well. And a lot of it was that there was this really tight three-act play story with a character arc and all that that motored the the told the story so we could you know put our little jokes on and and, and they'd be ornaments for this for this for the story and after top secret came out it didn't do as well and then we sort of went back and said wait a minute why we thought these were these great jokes how come they didn't work as well what was the problem and we realized how important story is even in parody and there's a difference between a lot of these comedy movies today and parody, I mean that specific genre of parody or, 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 or satire. And what we learned was, you know, after, especially after Top Secret, that it's really important to pay attention to story and make sure that those nuts and bolts are in place. So it, it be, because that makes the, that's really what makes a joke works. This is all a long harangue getting back to what's your, to your original question of, you know, how do you react to some of the parodies today? And I kind of feel like they don't pay much attention to story. They just, let's do this and this and this joke and this spoof and this spoof of this movie and that and let's run in credits. And it, so it doesn't, it, you know, they don't, it feels to me like they don't quite pay as much attention as they might to story. I, I can't, to, the, to those of you who, who want to write comedy or, I can't emphasize how important that is. That's that's just, you know, and and one I'll just give you one reason is that that kind of comedy is about distraction, and the more we can get people, you know, focused on whether the plane is going to land uh, and the drama of it, then the joke, don't call me, you know, I am serious, don't call me Shirley is. It's funny. It's a surprise. But if everybody's being silly and goofy, and and uh, and there's a story you don't care about, you know that same line will not be uh, as effective. And and uh, that's why we tried to keep the plane pretty s straight. We didn't have a goofy plane with three wings or some crazy thing. You know, that was if you want to see satire done incorrectly, uh, find a movie called The Big Bus. Yeah. It was out some before airplane, and it was about a nuclear powered bus and it was really you know this re incredibly long thing it had a bowling alley and it had all these crazy people and they tried to do all these the cliches of these crazy you know uh, 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 disaster movies and stuff, but it just it had no center you know it had no frame of reference for for people and and so it it didn't uh 
it didn't work at all and and uh it, it's just that's um I, I think that's you know if one of the most important things you can you can take with you tonight. So basically, it was like trial by fire, and the reason why I, I always love Top Secret, but I guess you can see if the, in terms of structure because it isn't built from start to finish based off of any other spoof or any other film. It I mean, kind of doesn't look at work. Val's character mm -hmm. in Top Secret, he was kind of a arrogant rock star at the beginning and kind of an arrogant rock star at the end. And he didn't learn, he didn't change, there was no arc. And, and Are you talking about Val or the character? It's the, yeah. No, that's a top secret, you know, it didn't have that we basically strung gags together, you know, and said, okay, someone at the end of one scene would say, oh, we've got to go now to the next scene, you know, and, and oh, no, we have this information, that means we better go here, but it, it didn't have any of that, you know, we didn't take time for people to care about the main character, we, we didn't have, um, you know, there was no, um, you know, uh, human f uh, uh, struggle or failing or or uh, a anything for for um, personally for the character to get out of all this. I mean, it was just we just just all of that was uh, was missing, and so we learned the hard way that it's important. <laughs> so, did you fix that? And was Naked Gun then the next one that you did after that? And we did you, you fixed it? Yeah, there there is much more attention paid in in Naked Gun. I can't say that Leslie didn't. Yeah, he did. Remember, there's a woman. He's been dumped, and he was trying to overcome he, he that. And I remember we actually added that scene um, uh, after we had, you know, after the script was kind of moving along. I mean, the the script had been finished, and we added the scene at the beginning where he gets off the plane. <clears throat> and says, is she here? And he says, no. And then he says, is the, well, then all of this is meaningless, you know? And it's, you know, we did it in funny context, but yet it's, it's still, you had that sense that Leslie was, um, you know, even though these crowds were cheering, they didn't, yeah. you know, of course, they weren't here, for, they weren't there for him. Yeah. They're not there for you. And, uh, yeah. Frank, but but uh, he he. Everywhere, everywhere I, lo I look, I see something that reminds me of her. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, with the you know, the Sand nuclear, the domes, <laughs> yes, and over domes. But I, but even though even those are all we're using that for jokes. It it you know it feels like Rodney Dangerfield stuff. You know, but it you you're creating a character, and and even though you know it's all for humor, you kind of want to, Leslie to be happy at the end because he has that um, that longing. And 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 also, if you just look at the whole structure of the Naked Gun, it's it's actually, it's 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 pretty good. It's not quite. I don't think it's it's not quite to the level of Zero Hour, but but uh, you know, an airplane. But it it is uh, it it it's a really good story with a, a you know a, a satisfying ending and all that. And the bad guy story works too. Yeah. 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 You know, every, I just wanted to mention that every single time that I drive to San Diego, I think of that line yeah. when yeah. I drive yeah. when I drive past the San Onofre uh, domes. Um, so yeah, there's that great part, and then at the end, it'd be a great place for a strip club, don't you think? Yeah, it's just you don't even need a neon sign; it already kind of says what it is. Um, there's uh, yeah, there's a great scene at the end when when uh, finally you know Frank proposes. And and the whole situation and and the entire audience is so psyched about it because yeah. they still think he's Enrique Palazzo, yeah, <laughs> which yeah. is so great. But you care for him as a character, you care for him for his heart because of that. Right. So it really works. Um, so in any event, you guys have been doing this for a long time. What direction are you uh, going in in the future professionally? How are you bringing your uh, your comedy to the world nowadays? We have no future. <laughs> We're very old, and uh, it's been great. Thank you. Um, no, we're <laughs> um, we're all sort of uh, uh, doing uh, different stuff. David is just finishing up Scary Movie Five. Um, that he, but he decided he didn't want to direct this one, so he just wrote and produced it. Uh, and and uh, I've been doing a lot of producing, although I really am kind of want to get back to directing so I have a few things I'm I'm working with and yeah well both yeah and and uh, 
And uh, Jim is the ne'er-do-well of the group. He's just been saving lives. Um, so I'm actually serious. He's, uh, he, well, I'll let him tell you, tell him about the uh, Charlie Foundation. Right, so I, I that's why I don't need that. I, uh, my life has taken me in a different direction. So I spend my days uh, working for a not-for-profit foundation that advocates uh, therapy for epilepsy. Can, can, we do a, can we do a shout out for that then? Yeah. Let's do yeah. a shout out for that. Okay. Yeah. It's actually, Jim is being modest, it's really extraordinary, and he, he really has saved lives because he's made this, uh, this diet that, that is, you know, in 50% in or more, is it, cases could actually cure ep epilepsy without drugs or without um, operations, and of course, you know, no pharmaceutical is going to advertise that or, or, or make a big deal out of it, and, and uh, um, you know, a lot of doctors are just have you know been ignorant of it, and Jim really discovered this kind of unknown uh, cure, this this process, and uh, has popularized it. I mean, it's now it, it just they they have this entire foundation and 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 scientists working on figuring out exactly why it works and how to ex they're expanding it to Alzheimer's and other uh, things, and it's it's actually it's actually pretty amazing and and. Uh, um, you know, Jim frequently talks to people um, uh, around the country who, you know, have him. He's not a doctor, but they're, they're asking him, how does this work? How do we do it? Will it apply to our child and all that kind of stuff? And, and um, uh, it, it's, um, uh, it's, it's, it's really pretty remarkable. Well, you know, I think it goes into the whole thing that if you have a heart in the, in the you know, core of the story, then it's always compelling. And I think that that's amazing that you're doing that well, stuff. We really appreciate it. And, and mm -hmm. part of the, you know, that we we talk about all the time was, can I'll tell Mrs. Zabatsky. So sure. <laughs> yeah, so long bef before we all started together, the house next to David and Jerry's house. No, our house. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 you're right. It's caught on fire. And a woman who lived next door, Mrs. Zabatsky, went on her porch, saw the house was on fire, uh, called the fire no, truck, we, or, or you, you, sorry, you, you tell the story, and I'll... We, yeah, so, we, we, uh, so the roof of the house, of our house was burning, and, and we called the fire department, the fire department came, and, and the firemen were, you know, uh, setting up their, were, uh, you know, ladders, and they were, you know, t going through the elaborate process of, of, of uh, undoing and bringing in these ladders, and meanwhile the roof is burning, and Mrs. Zabatsky, who was uh, on, the, on her porch at next door, you know, leans over and screams to the, the firemen, um, just, just, you know, forget the ladders, just point the hose at the fire. And to their credit, the firemen did this and extinguished the blaze in about two minutes, you know, and, and which, so. Which led to Mrs. Zabatsky's Law, which we always talked about through our whole careers in our lives. And Mrs. Zabatsky's Law is never assume uh, you can't do someone else's job better than they can. <laughs> and, 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 and that was really when, when I reflect on my life, I think that's why we made airplane, that's why we were bold enough to do what we did back then, and that's frankly uh, had a lot to do with my second career of trying to tackle uh, the medical establishment and their kind of uh, poo-pooing you know, diet as, as a therapy. But it was Mrs. Zabatsky who kind of set the tone for all of us. And I might add, the corollary to Mrs. Zabatsky's law is never assume someone else can't do your job better than you. Anyway, guys, I've, um, I think you guys are really great. And one of the things I think is so amazing is in a city like uh, Los Angeles, Hollywood, you know, in this industry where things can be pretty harsh and people can turn on each other and have a lot of problems with, with you know, personality issues and politics and all this stuff, just the fact that you guys are still 
you genuinely like each other. At least one would imagine. It seems like eh. you guys genuinely like each other. You hang out together. You guys do a lot of events like this, and it's just so great to see you guys spending that time. How does how does it feel to have your old buddies from back, you know, Shorewood, uh, Shorewood days, still being some of the people that that you're able to spend so much time with out here in Hollywood? Uh, it's 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 great. I mean, it, in terms of the three of us, um, we we find any excuse to get together. <laughs> that's why we uh, that's why we accepted this gig. <laughs> Otherwise, if one of us had to do it individually, we thought they, originally that oh, yeah. David would would be there too. But we just we like um, you know we get together periodically and have dinner or lunch or whatever, and mm -hmm. and it just you know it's just it's just. It's it's fun. So so and and we still we st we still all have a lot of uh, friends from you know from Milwaukee and, and Madison. So it's 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 great. Cool. Um, we wanted to see if anybody out in the audience might have a question for the guys up here. We might take like two or three questions. And because of the fact that we're actually shooting, actually, if, excuse me for a second, because of the fact that we're shooting, if anybody, uh, who do we got? Yeah, if you, if you can actually come up and uh, come up in front here. Thanks. There we go. There we go. He's good at directing. All right. So you can stand up here and actually turn around, so we'll catch you up on this camera up there. there well, I don't really have a question. It's more of a story because. Um... <laughs> All right, no, it's important. This is important because I've been a huge comedy fan for years, and I was an usher in a theater when the airplane opened, and it opened the theater. The theater was brand new, and there were six theaters. Okay, this is in South Florida, and it was packed every show, packed. I used to go whenever I had a chance. I'd go stand in the back of the theater. And wait for the certain jokes, just just to hear the people laugh, because I was like, "Yep, that's funny," that over and over again. <laughs> um, but also, when I realized you had the credits that were full of jokes, I would tell everyone, "Stay for the credits, stay for the because no one stayed for the credits, especially the best after-credit joke ever in a movie with the guy in the taxi. Still, the best joke, and you revolutionized that. And I just thought that was uh, such an influence for me as a kid." When Christmas time came around, six months later, it was still playing there. That's how popular it was. So I just wanted to share that with you. Thanks for all the laughs. Thanks for the laughs, guys. Uh, do we have any other questions? Let's see. Do you want them to stand over here? Okay, great. We'll do it that way. All right. So come on forward. Or right, wait. Oh, he's just standing up to make some room. All right. We'll bring this gentleman forward. He can stand right over here by me. By the way, we've decided that's a better camera angle. Here you go. Okay. Uh, right to that camera. Stand over. Right, you come over here. <laughs> All right. Beep, 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 okay. beep. Okay, uh, and then turn around. <laughs> and then look at that camera and talk to them. <laughs> can, you, can you tell us anything about ghosts, how that came about? Um, no. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, after um, uh, our, our, our ruthless, we had, uh, I think we just, we, we uh, had uh, made ruthless people and then written <clears throat> the naked god or maybe it was after it was it was shot or whatever um i was looking for something to you know to direct and and uh uh i was talking with uh um uh, lindsey duran who was an executive at at paramount uh and and i would say i would asking her what what do you have and and she said, well, there's this great, the best thing we have here is this script called Ghost, but it's not really a comedy. And I said, I don't care. I don't really, I, I really don't want to do satire again. I felt a little burnt out maybe by that, or I just felt like doing something different. And she said, well, you might like it. And I was very lucky because um, I don't think anybody at any other studio would have ever given me that script based on my our prior films. Uh, but because they knew me, you know, the Lindsay and the and the executives, they, you know, I think somehow they thought, gee, maybe Jerry would be the right guy for for this. So so, uh, um, and I read it and I really I I loved it and uh, um, you know met with them and and they said okay. Uh, of course, the writer uh, Bruce Joel Rubin when he f he found out that. 
you know, Jerry Zucker was going to direct his beautiful, you know, spiritual love story, cried. Um, that's actually a true story. I'm not joking. That's a true story. But we're uh, Bruce and I have become great friends now, and and uh, we we joke about that. <laughs> Um, so this is uh, another time for us to do a reminder for all the people that are out there watching this live streaming. I think we've already gotten some questions uh, sent in to us here from the theater, from all the people streaming out there. So um, we'll take one more question here, and then we'll go to the questions that we have uh, that we've pulled in from our live viewing audience out in the Ethernet. Let's go with uh, this young lady over here. <laughs> All right, stand up. It's right here. Here we go. And then you turn around and take the microphone. There you go. All right. Um, um, I was <laughs> just wondering uh, if you guys have personal favorite jokes out of the many jokes you made, and also if there was ever a joke that one of you loved but the other one hated, and there was a conflict on whether it would stay in the movie or not. Uh, well, good question. Yeah. Um, I, I well let me take the second part first. Um, I, obviously, we always just oh hi, this is much better. Um, so you know when we had these jokes, we kind of uh, you know the thing is uh, um, we we uh, um, we we, uh, uh, we would um, uh, talk. We argued about. Uh, you know, a lot of jokes, man, a lot of things we just, we've all just loved, but you know, there was, oh, well, there was always arguments. One good thing, that's the good thing about working with three people, there's always a, a decision, but, but we, um, in the end, once we screened it, either it would get a laugh or it wouldn't. So if it got a laugh, I mean, in a good laugh, you know, we, nobody could, that was, that was that, that it would go in. And if it didn't, you know, I mean, all three of us, even the, the person who you know argued vehemently for it would say cut it out immediately you know because it, it we and one thing we did which is was actually I think great we never um, is he trying, he's oh he's gone oh good um, <laughs> what's your name Diana hi Diana um, yeah good thank you um, the the uh, we, we uh, the three of us never um, talked, to, we never took individual credit for gags. I mean, a lot of gags were, one of us would say, oh, how about something like this? And the other person would say, oh, no, this. And, the other, and it would, they would build. But obviously a joke that someone just, boom, they thought of the line or the joke or whatever, we just never, um, you know, people always say, oh, who thought of this or who thought of that? And, I, and we just, um, we never uh, talked about that. And as a result, we weren't fighting over my joke or your joke, and and so that helped. And then, as far as favorite jokes, I don't know. I'm I'm you know my favorite joke is usually the one that's getting the laugh at the time. But I do. I mean, I don't know. It's hard to say to people because I have so there's so many that that uh, you know I've I've always loved you know the Peter Graves as a child molester. Always you know I, I don't know. I I always um, I always love uh, watching that. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. Pedophilia is pedophilia is great. Child molester across the board. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thanks to the Catholic Church, yes. All right. Thank you, Diane. All right, guys. We actually may I borrow the microphone? We actually did get one question in. Uh, one one of the questions that we chose from the from the audience that was watching out at home that I think a lot of people are probably thinking out there was um, why do you think so many comedians come? This one's from Paul B. And why do you think so many comedians come out of Wisconsin and for and for that matter Canada? Is it something with the cold? Well, they come out of Wisconsin because it's cold. <laughs> um, why? Well, you know, we, we've we've talked about over the years that there's a, if that there's a certain um, mentality growing up in the Midwest as opposed to the coast. I mean, you, you never, you know, everything is shot out here or in New York, and there these big centers where people think, "Well, I'm from where it's cool." But if you're from Milwaukee, you're kind of always the brunt of the joke. And so you kind of learn, and this is 
take it for what. But, but uh, so you kind of learn a self-effacing sense of humor. You learn to laugh at yourself. And basically, that's what our movies have always done. And we've taken things that people take seriously and laugh at them. And so maybe there is something to not coming from, you know, to that kind of background. Excellent. Well, we're really glad that you guys were able to come here today. We love all the work that you've been doing. And uh, I'm wondering, is there any possible chance that you guys would end up working on anything in the future together? Uh, you never know. We talk from time to time about, about uh, things. And I think it's absolutely, uh, you know, a, a possibility. Because you guys together, it's never been better, I got to tell you. Don't you guys agree? I think so. All right. You guys, thank you so much for coming out today. Let's hear it for our guests of honor, Jerry Zucker, Jim Abrams. Thank you so much for coming, you guys. Thank you. All right. To our audience at home, we have a few other people to thank. We want to thank Scott Ramsey from Broadcast Support, Michael Akers from Shoe Spring Productions, Paul Baumgartner from Sonic Foundry, Theater Asylum, and Matt Quinn, the location we're at currently. Uh, special assistance from Colby Roberts and Megan Marquardt. Uh, photography by Tim Barley. And I didn't want to forget to include myself. Yes, I was your host tonight, John Baumgartner. Thank you so much for coming, you guys. It was a lot of fun. And once again, let's hear an, an, another time for these amazing gentlemen, Jerry Zucker and Jim Abrams. Thank you very much for our audience at home. And good night. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. It was great. It was a lot of fun.